Yeah, okay. Next year, I wondered if it was that. I was like, I was wondering if it was that. I Good evening and welcome to the Board of Education meeting for Thursday, March 16, 2017. May I have the attendance? Mrs. Daly? Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Mrs. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Mrs. Starr? Here. Mrs. Hobb? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Thank you. Would you please join me in the pledge of allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Okay. Are there any members of the public in the audience tonight that would like to speak on this evening's agenda? here tonight was Donna spent one weekend, uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes on the phone talking to me about this, this issue. And uh, I thought based on that I should come and, and listen and try to, uh, try to learn a little bit about it. So I wanted to thank her, but she's not here. Yeah. <laughs> she's watching. She's watching. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Um, Proficiency-based education is totally different and so it will be I opened it for a lot of people. I'm glad you're here for a refresher. Um, okay, so that's it for public comments. We're on to 6.0 new business. Uh, meeting minutes of February 15th. Do I have a motion? The approval is printed. Second. Any adjustments or comments? Okay, all in favor? Five plus two. Well, yeah, because you weren't here. No, I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then uh, appointment 6.2, uh, 6.2.1 middle school spring coaching appointment. So various school staff and community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the middle school spring coaching positions as presented in the agenda in item 6.2.1. So moved. Second. Any comments about the coaching positions? Mr. Legage is not here this evening, so I really can't Mr. Brown can answer. Uh, yeah, oh, Mr. Brown can answer. Yeah. answer. Yeah. So um, the two <coughs> TBDs that yeah. are there, are you currently interviewing? Yeah, or? we're currently in the process okay. of so interviewing. So we're just waiting for the exactly. next maybe meeting? Sorry. Yep. Yeah, Thank they'll you. be there for the next meeting. All right, thanks. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So ready? All in favor? Thank you. 6.2.2, district-wide point six school psychologist. Um, so we have been interviewing for this position for some time, and I'm excited to announce that Dr. Jane Coolidge, if I'm saying that correctly, um, has been nominated to fill this position created by a resignation. Dr. Bullis received her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Southern Maine, as well as both her master's degree and her doctorate in school psychology from the University of Southern Maine. She has been a school psychologist in several local school districts, including the Thalmas Public Schools and the Portland Public Schools. Most recently, she has been practicing in both the Margaret Murphy Center for Children and Maine Child Psychology. Dr. Bullis will be placed on step 18 of the Master's Plus 30 scale uh, per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Dr. Jane Bullis as the district-wide point six school psychologist. Move approval. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, all in favor? Six plus two, thank you. It's a quick business portion of our regular workshop meeting, so that takes us to 7.0. Um, and 7.1 is our agenda item, it's proficiency-based education. Like I said, it's totally different, so let's hear it all. Well, we have been <laughs> working really hard and can, um, 
collaboratively as a team across the district. And many of the folks who are a part of that work are here tonight. So um, I'm really excited to have teachers as well as you know formal district leaders and building leaders here tonight. And I'm just going to ask that each of them go around and announce their names um, and what school you work in and what your position is so that our community that's watching knows who's sharing their smart thinking about our work um, getting to proficiency. And then Monique um, Colbertson, our Director of Curriculum and Assessment, is going to lead the conversation, but everyone in the room is prepared to offer insights and um, thoughts as questions come up. So we really wanted to make it an engaging um, conversation throughout the workshop. So we'll start down here and kind of wrap around. I'm David Currier, assistant principal at the middle school. I'm David Creech, principal at the high school. I'm Catherine Ruby, the director of teaching and learning at the high school. Eric Vaznik, the head of the foreign languages department at the high school. Kelly Crosby, the principal at Wentworth School. Dan Lovejoy, principal at Eight Corners. Alan Fashion, student representative. Jody Shea, school board member. Mary Starr, school board member. Julie Kukenberger, <laughs> superintendent. Kelly Murphy, school board. Joanne Sizemore, assistant superintendent. Christine Massingill, school board. Carrie Lambert, school board. Jackie Perry, school board. Elizabeth Hobbs, student representative. Justin Stebbins, um, association president and middle school world language teacher. Monique Culberton, director of curriculum and assessment. Amy Johnston, seventh grade social studies teacher. Jacob Brown, seventh grade social studies teacher and middle school athletic director. Kathy Terrell, the middle school math instructional coach and a 612 sciences instructional coach. Allison Marquez, director of social services. Barbara Hassel, and principal of the middle school. So you can see that we have um, a broad spectrum of talents and skills here at the table. And we've been, like I said, working really collaboratively to kind of map out this work, building on the work that's been ongoing, and then you know, bring us through our journey. Sure. <coughs> so much for that introduction. Um, much work has taken place within the district, uh, but there's an awful lot of more work to do. Uh, and what I'd like to do is share a little bit of that update and then open it up to questions and um, responses from our team here tonight. <clears throat> so our changing society is really causing a shift in all schools around the country and it's causing us to take a look at the purpose of school. So here in Scarborough, our purpose of our schools is really ensuring high levels of learning for each and every student. Uh, and that is not a new statement for Scarborough, that actually was built um, from Scarborough. But it's really our changing society and our economy that's creating these shifts that are taking place within our schools. Why proficiency-based education specifically? It's really about improving student learning <coughs> and what we're working on doing in, through this proficiency-based education system is ensuring access to that guaranteed and viable curriculum that you've heard about. It's also focusing on continuous learning, not learning that's done at the end of the year, but growing learners who continually learn. But it's also about clearly communicating students' academic skills and knowledge, supporting them in developing habits that promote success, those learning-to-learn -learn skills, but also helping students track and monitor their own learning so they're engaged in their own learning and can, can take charge of their own learning. But I believe, most importantly, it really prepares students uh, for success. Success in college, success in the workplace, and success in a rapidly changing society. <clears throat> Change is a process. We in education like to be planful. We like our ducks in order. <laughs> we like those straight rows every once in a while, and we plan things to happen in a certain way. Uh, but because this is transformational change, this is systemic change, we have to be open to learning as we're moving along this road of ours. So while we would like it to be a straight shot, it's probably going to be filled with a few curves and hills and valleys. We're learning from others, from other school districts uh, who've done this before, but also um, we're learning from the research as well. We're keeping an eye on the research, and we're also learning from experience. But along this journey, we want you to understand that through our community dialogues, we're listening to the community, and that's how we've developed our goals with our improvement plan over the years. And along with that, we have improvement targets. Those are set and reviewed annually. And we provide progress updates to the board and to the community on our goals. 
Our goal number one is really about providing world-class, student-centered teaching and learning to prepare every student to thrive in learning, career, and life. It really aligns with our purpose of schools, and this student-centered learning piece is really what we're talking about when we're talking about proficiency-based education. It's really a subset of the student-centered learning piece. So our overarching goal is the student-centered learning piece, but there are proficiency-based education practices that we're developing. I want you to know that this is not um, a brand new thing. As a matter of fact, this slide comes from a presentation to the then school board on December 19th and 2013. In the 27th month of our targeted improvement, we talked about goal one being focused around teaching and learning. And it included a couple of pieces that we were working on even back then. College and career readiness, we were focused on that piece. We were focused on the student center learning, but also so focused on the proficiency-based diploma piece. So we've been at this for quite some time. Within our 24-month improvement plan, we have targets, specific targets. And these specific targets really bring the student centered learning system piece in place and it dovetails rather well with the state law around proficiency. So we'll be meeting the letter of the law but building a proficiency-based education system that works for our students in Scarborough. And again, to ensure success for all students. Because in education we get full of a lot of educational jargon and we have standards across different content areas and when we talk to different schools and we talk to the state, Everyone's using different language, so we spent an awful lot of time this year and we will continue to do so to build some common language around what we mean by a standard, what we mean by a learning goal and learning targets. Uh, and most importantly, we need that common language within our system so that as our students <coughs> matriculate through the system, they have a common language that they're working from. So what is a definition of proficiency-based education? This is one in which we've captured the essence. I'm going to read it and then describe, and then I'll try and translate a bit. Proficiency-based education refers to systems of instruction, assessment, grading, and academic reporting that are based on students demonstrating that they have learned the knowledge and skills they are expected to learn as they progress through their education. It's also referred to as mastery-based, standards-based, we've got competency-based. <clears throat> but what it means for students, in short, it means that they understand what they're learning, why they're learning it, and can describe their learning goal and track their progress. They can show what they know by applying what they know in real-life situations. They know their own interests and strengths and can advocate for themselves both in and out of the classroom. A very important skill in order to be college and career ready. An important skill to be successful in college. Also, they feel comfortable, confident, speaking up in agreement, disagreement, or wonderment as they pursue their own learning with their peers and their teachers. So we're trying to grow independent learners. They also engage in cooperative, inquiry-based, authentic, and relevant activities to advance their learning. All of that best practice in terms of instruction. So how are we doing this work? <clears throat> this slide describes our structure and our process. We certainly have our district leadership team, everyone involved. We have building leadership groups that are also involved in the work. We have cross-phase level curriculum groups working in the curriculum areas, but we also have as you see, members before you of this proficiency-based education steering committee. And what we've done is we've chunked out the work in moving forward into these work groups. We have a graduation requirements, policy development group, a content scales group, a guiding principles work group, and a power teacher pro gradebook work group, and then a habits of work and learning work group. And they're in process. They don't work in isolation. We work together and we come together as a steering group to make decisions. But more specifically, um, this proficiency-based education, the piece of the law has developed, has given us a bit of a sense of urgency in our work. And we are going to transition into the work, uh, and this slide describes a bit of that transition. One of the requirements is for the graduating class of 2021, those eighth graders, 
they need to have four content areas, show proficiency in four content areas as well as the guiding principles, but then each year after that they're going to add a content area of their choice in order to earn a proficiency-based diploma. <clears throat> so for the class of 2021, the four content areas, the diploma will be earned through a proficiency-based system and the guiding principles as well. And I want to go back to the why on this and then open it up for some questions from you. Uh, it really is about all students. It's about that guaranteed and viable curriculum. It's about that continuous growth and learning. It's about that clear communication around what students know and can do. Uh, but it's also students owning their own learning. And it's really about our ability to better market our students to colleges and to the world of career, but it's also our ability to make sure that our students are successful in college and in careers in this changing society. <clears throat> Questions? Um, and that would be, so in that year 2021 when our current eighth graders are showing profi proficiency in the four areas, um, what happens to the foreign language and the fine arts and those other pieces, are those still going to be graded traditionally? I've never really heard anybody say anything about that. Yeah, we're looking into developing a dual system because we are going to have kids, in, we're going to have kids in the proficiency system and we'll have kids in the regular system. So those transcripts and those pieces, we're working on those systems, the technical systems around that to make sure that those pieces stay in place while developing a new piece. Is there anything folks want to add to that? So it, is a, it really is a transition. Right. Okay. <coughs> Jackie, did you have a question? Yes, I would like to know how we are preparing our teachers, especially at the elementary level, for a less repetitive uh, delivery of the education system. Sure. One of the pieces around this work is articulating those standards and learning goals. And part of this proficiency system is that students, if they meet those, they would move on in terms of content. So knowing that um, our teachers, our curriculum, and those learning goals are more public, teachers know where to then lead students. With students knowing their own goals, for example, in, the, um, <coughs> in our literacy curriculum at the elementary and also in our math curriculum at the elementary, they know the big ideas that they're working on, and once they achieve those, they can move on to the next piece. And, and one of the things I would add to that is that we are also shifting our focus so that it's not just about um, meeting, the, meeting the minimal proficiency, but also thinking about how do we enrich students' learning so that they're getting a deep conceptual understanding of concepts and really developing those high-level critical thinking skills um, and problem-solving skills. So it's not like a, a race to the finish line kind of thing. Sometimes people think like, oh, then kids can just like, accelerate their learning. Um, it's more about enriching their learning and developing deeper thinkers. Can I continue? Yes. I mean, sure. I, I'm sure others have questions. No, go ahead. Yeah. How do we explain to parents and the public about interactive learning? Because when I grew up, and I'm probably older than everybody in the room, but that's beside the point, and I did go to a Catholic school, which was probably worse. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of activity in the classroom. I mean, you didn't talk to your neighbor. If you talked to your neighbor, then you stayed after school. And there was nothing known as working together to solve a problem. You know, what we've learned about how students and adults learn has changed over time. And so our teaching practices are changing. Um, as well, uh, and in terms of communicating to the community, I, I would, um, you know, there are lots of opportunities through parent conferences. Uh, the students themselves can talk about the kinds of learning within their classrooms uh, as well um, in terms of communicating that, but what we're doing is we're, it's more interactive because that's more effective in terms of learning um, is the short answer to that, but our communication modes with parents is sort of multifaceted. 
and the best communication is the parent's ability to see the evidence um, of the learning in their, in their child. I think it's important um, to sort of step back a little bit with regards to that, because I think the students absolutely get it. When I hear my kids talk about assessments coming up and the way they use the language, it's obvious to me that they get it better than probably most parents do because it's very different than how we were tested. Um, so I, I, we all know because we've been living it, but it's a huge shift in how parents are going to see results from their students. It's, it's not an A or a B or a 95 or something like that. It's, it's in depth and, and the kids are, if I got a 75 on a test when I was a kid, I got a 75. 25% of that I didn't know. Whereas now if, if kids get a 75 or whatever um, on a test, it's, it's an opportunity to continue to learn more and understand, okay, there's part of this that I didn't get. I need to continue learning that subject. And so it's an ever-evolving learning. A absolutely. And, and the, um, I think the point is an important one that we need to do quite a bit of communication with parents, and that's part of what we're working on in, a, in our steering committee, um, is providing parents with communication, um, information, but also experiences with it and around it. Um, and some of it can come from the students themselves. Uh, because that's what I, I think parents are concerned that students learn mm -hmm. and learn and have you know high levels of learning uh, and this is a way for that to happen but we also have to help parents understand that the communication home what we would call a report card might look different and why it looks different um, and what it says and that likewise, it's okay that it looks different. Absolutely. And likewise, you know, when we talk about the high school transcript and what that looks like, that needs to look like a, a better way to communicate what our students know. For me, it's a marketing tool for our students. Mm -hmm. And that transcript needs to better market our students to colleges, universities, and in the world of work. Um, and that's what we're going to be working on is, is making sure that that does exactly that better job of communicating to those institutions for our kids. I think um, Wentworth kids already know it, already get it, and if you're a parent of a Wentworth student, you already get it. We've had friends and coworkers ask us, like, what do you mean it's changing? What is this going to mean? But if they've had, they have a kid currently at Wentworth, or very recently, we say, it's like the rubrics at Wentworth. It's not scary. <laughs> you know exactly what it is. You just don't know that's what it's called. But kids understand what they're missing on assignments or, you know, based on when they get their scores back. It's not just that they got to be on a paper. They know exactly was it sentence structure, was it paragraph structure, was it vocabulary, was it another target of the assignments they're missing. They already know it as soon as they get it back from a teacher. There's no, like, kind of scratching their head. Did More I not write well that. enough? Right. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, today. absolutely. More about feedback on a continuum of learning than a final score. Mm -hmm. um, and the the thinking for kids, and they see a final score is done. You know, oh, yeah. 75. I didn't do that well. But um, providing feedback on a continuum shows, okay, this is where you were. This is where you're heading. This is where you are right now at this moment in time. Learning becomes mm -hmm. the constant when time is more variable like that. And then they can focus on what it is that they're missing. I mean, this is just one example that made me think of it today was we were walking out of school at the end of Wentworth today. My son said we had a math assessment and he missed three days last week because he was sick. And he said, I didn't do that well because I don't know how to do the area of a triangle. I missed all that. But he wanted to go home and Google it and look it up because he knew exactly what it was that he was missing. Even though his teacher's like, it's okay, it's okay. But he knows exactly what it was that he didn't meet the standard on it and it was because of that thing because of the way the feedback comes to comes to the students and I think that's going to be such an empowering thing for kids and their parents to know if somebody's struggling what is the thing what what do we need to do or um, what are they doing very well that we can translate to other areas um, Jeff, before your question could be yeah. could I just follow up a bit I maybe some of the teachers here 
year and either school could, could share some of the examples of what they do. But um, it's powerful because students know what the expectations are. They know what they're learning. They know what their target is. And they can make choices. Yeah. They can make it, which is, it, it gives them so much power, like mm -hmm. your son has. Yeah. Would, would anyone here like to talk about some of the things they do with around that? I think the big thing is students tracking their own progress. Mm -hmm. So um, whether it's a short-term learning objective, whether it's a longer-term learning goal, um, you know, they know where they're at so it doesn't come to the end of the quarter and they're worried about their academic grade. It's, it's a continuous learning cycle throughout the whole process. So. Mm -hmm. I, I had a kid describe this as, I love being in your class because in some classes I start at 100 and I can only go down. <laughs> and in your class I start at the beginning and I get to go as far as I can. And, and as, as quick as I can and I get to learn more if I want to. So, I mean, it, I think it's very powerful to them that when I say, we're going to do an assessment today, like today I, I did that, and they're like, great, now I get to know what I have to go learn more of. So it ends up being very empowering. And I think it's, a, um, it's about trying to engage kids and getting them to to do activities that are, at, where ev it helps you as a teacher get everything um, lined up so that it's all leading to a point. So when you have that standard, then when you're designing your homework, when you're designing your assessments, the, all those things take on a different kind of meaning because you're all tracking it to a certain goal all the time and the kids can see their path on it, the teacher can see their path on it. So. I think it, 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 it's interesting hearing us, too, though, talk um, that we've already talked a couple times about the grades and the transcripts, and that's always what everybody jumps to. But that's really the last piece, and I think that the most important piece is that people need to get their standards set up. They need to get lined up with, the, with those standards. That's why it's called standards-based in some, kind, in some uh, school districts. So that's going to be part of what is really important for us, and a lot of schools are already uh, we're already working on that, and we have to keep that going. So everyone has to be real clear: what are the standards? How are we assessing those standards? Um, what are the targets within those standards? What are the goals within those standards? So there's a, that's where, when people are hearing this is a lot of work and this is a big deal, that's where a lot of the work is, is going to be involved, and, and we're we're seeing that as, as we do it, even those of us who are using it now you see, you know, I've done all this and I still have this much more that I can improve on. So, can I just worry? We are used to the term standards and all the, all the parts of this, but just as an example for people who are here at home, could we just in each content area, somebody define a standard? Just say what a standard in your content area would be, just to make it clear what we're talking about. So they both teach social studies, so maybe talk about <laughs> Standard one learning goal in some maybe a, a, a level two um, learn, uh, target and then a level three target. Okay. Uh, one of our standards is creating compelling questions in which students have to um, create a series of questions that are compelling and not shallow, you know, flat questions. Um, what was the learning goal under that? Well, it would be uh, like one of them is that they can they can create supporting questions um, under that fall under an underlying theme. You know, and the language is a little different, so um, they may get a you know a larger inquiry question, and students are creating some smaller questions that they could re they could use that question to generate some research. Um, and then a lot of like the level two daily targets would fall under some vocabulary. So um, it would be really, if we're, if we're talking about a new lesson, um, a lot of that level two stuff in our scales would be dealing with, you know, the, the vocab, because that's where we see a lot of, if students struggle, we, you know, a lot of it is just trying to figure out, you know, if they know that, that key vocabulary. And also within the level two would be teacher um, supported, so they can do it with some teacher support. And so they're talking about level two, level three, because we're looking at the idea of how can we use a four-point scale to help students know where they are and where they need to go? We're still defining exactly what that looks like in Scarborough, um, and we're still working on some of the language that will be used, and a lot of teachers are testing it out. So 
um, I think that it would be really helpful if some of the teachers shared, like, what kind of language are you using for students to know whether they're level one, level two, level three, or level four when it comes to your scales in your classroom? I can give an example of when I was teaching an eighth grade math class a couple years ago. We were working on um, solving equations. So the learning goal was being able to solve equations and then apply that to real world problems. And so students know that if they are need guided practice and they're not quite independent, they're at that level two, that they need help. So you know, you wouldn't really have a kid raise their hand and say, you know, I'm I'm only thirty percent on this, will you help me? But you know, I'm still a two. I need, um, you know, I need your help. Could you come over and help me get to independence? So one of the classes I was in the other day at Wentworth, the teacher was using language like a one would be I need help, a two is I'm making progress, a three is I got it, and a four was I can teach it. With like a really simplified scale. But mm -hmm. what, what's the language that you use in at the high school in world language? Because it's a little bit different, but it's along those lines. Yes, yeah, along the lines of uh, we're more saying that they've met the they've met the standard. They've um, if they're at the three, but then we'll say if they're at a two, like they've they've partially met the standard. Um, and if they're at a, uh, if they, when they're getting up to like a four, because we've used a five point scale with our experience, when they get to a four, it's uh, we're saying. They've met, they've met some of the standards and exceeded some other ones. Uh, and then when they get to a five, now they're exceeding all those. So, And we did the five-point scale because we have a lot of AP classes and AP runs on a five-point scale. So that's yeah. kind of the, the language that, was, that we started using. So. And you might be referring to also if students are working towards that learning goal, there are targets along the way to get there. Right. So when students are saying, how are you doing just on that target, some language might be not yet, mm -hmm. got it, good to go, I can teach others. Yeah. I think the big shift also is we're almost more like coaches in the classroom rather than teachers. Um, you know, a lot of it's the same, like, I'm fairly new to the district, like three years ago, and a lot of the interview questions was along those same, um, along those same lines of student-centered learning and inquiry-based and project-based learning. So I think the biggest difference is really going to be just reporting out on that now. You see a lot of this, a lot of this stuff in classrooms right now. So. And so are the younger teachers that are coming out of college? Is that how they're learning? Yeah. To teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. all, yeah. I mean, and yeah. when I was in college, they were all all proficiency based. Yeah. All the all the state uh, main <coughs> state teaching courses. Yeah. I always focused on rubrics, understanding yeah. essential questions, the tools that lead to students really understanding and owning their own learning. So it's not only a shift <coughs> for our students and our ultimately the parents, I guess, but mm -hmm. it's also for the the teachers that have been teaching for many many years. It's it's a huge shift. It's a, it's a huge shift. So a big part of this work is the time that we need to professionally develop our staff because um, we're asking them to gain a whole new skill set, a whole new knowledge base um, around this work. And so that takes time because just like our students are all in their own individual places in terms of their learning and understanding, so are the adult learners. Um, and so we are asking ourselves two questions about our students every day in every class after every lesson. What do they do well? What are they ready to learn? As Kelly was saying earlier, it's the same thing about our staff. Um, and we have to have the patience to allow people to come along this journey, and that's why we're calling it a journey at their own pace. Because just telling people to make the shift isn't going to truly change the hearts and the minds in the way that we need to for this type of direct, this, this really intentional teaching to have an impact on our students. Jackie had a question. I have three questions. One for Thomas, one for Elizabeth, and one for Mr. Bazette. I can't even say Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I only have them once a day, Jackie. <laughs> the first one, Thomas, I would like you to tell us how this approach has changed the way you learn. My question for Elizabeth is, how is this approach, I know you have a little sister. Yes. And how is her learning today different from when you were her age? 
And <laughs> how has this changed your approach to teaching? I'll start so you guys can have some time to think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, it's, it's changed our approach. Uh, we did kind of a, a what, what you'll hear this term a lot, we did a backward design. So we started with our upper uh, level classes and tried to design backwards from there because the upper level classes are the ultimate goal. That's the standard you're trying to get to. So you're designing backwards from that. So what we did was we started looking at um, what we want kids to be able to do. And so they need to be able to speak uh, in both a casual way and in a formal way. And the standard for that is uh, presentational communication. That's what the standard is called. And uh, interpersonal communication would be the more casual kind of uh, version. So you have to speak and write in both of those. But if I take speaking as an example, <coughs> one of the things that we've started doing is we used to always have some conversational activities in class that were sort of an interview um, where the kids ask and answer uh, questions using whatever grammar and vocabulary we've been studying in a unit. But now we've started adding to it um, some activities that are how would you situations. So we give them a situation and we say, all right, you're in the airport and you are, your plane is late. Uh, how are you going to express to the person at the counter that you missed your flight and you need a new you need a new ticket and uh, then we g we have kind of a it's a basically a situation where they're saying well they, they're saying there's no flight till tomorrow so how are you going to respond will you accept that or not so you're trying to get them beyond just the back and forth answering of, of questions which uh, we did before um, and getting them more into creating on their own and placing them into that kind of realistic situation. Then when we get to an actual assessment later on on that unit, those questions that they've done as a speaking activity are coming up again on the test. And so they've done multiple of these, and we have sort of a bank of them, and we'll pick a couple of them for the assessment, the, the test. Um, and they'll have to do that uh, either in writing or if they're in the upper levels, they have to do it in a recording. Or in the very highest levels, the AP, they have to sit down one-on-one -on -one, uh, with me as a teacher and do that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. So you're kind of scaffolding up the level of difficulty. Um, but you're also given them multiple opportunities, and that's something you'll hear a lot of, multiple pathways. Um, that's our department's goal for next year. We've done really well in developing the standards and aligning our standards to those assessments. But one of the things you have to do also is multiple pathways. You have to give kids multiple opportunities to something. And that's something that that's our goal for next year. We don't have a lot of multiple pathways right now. So when a kid doesn't do well on something, uh, how do you give them another chance at that? How do you, uh, how do you give them uh, another opportunity to get assessed? So that'll be our goal now that we've done those other areas. But that's why we say that this is a long process because it's taken us a while to get our standards lined up, get our, get our activities and, uh, lined up to, to those standards, then get our assessments lined up, and, and now try to come up with multiple ways to do that. You know, So it, it's definitely a multiple year process that, that's going to have to happen. But Is it easier to teach that way? No. <laughs> um, no, it's definitely um, more work, though it, it is um, how do we say it? I, I, I guess it, it feels more realistic. It, like it, and so in that sense, it feels more like you're trying to, you have to work more to come up with those kinds of scenarios for the kids. Um, but it feels a little more realistic, so you don't feel like you have to spend time convincing them that this is going to be important someday. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put them in those situation, uh, situations and show them how it's important and, and realistic. So. And it also translates to anyone being in a Spanish 2 course or what, whatever the consistent course is, it doesn't matter whether I have Mr. Zvaznik or another teacher, that work is consistent across those classrooms. And really that, that was one point I was going to make, that you heard when Eric's talking about his teaching and, and the learning in, in the world language classes, notice that he keeps saying we, and he's not saying I. And notice that Jake and Amy were basically finishing each other's sentences when they were talking about learning goals and learning targets. Our teachers are the expectation is that they're truly co-laboring around this work and that um, they're making sure that there's a consistent understanding that we all, what we think the standard says is, is consistent across all grade levels and that gets at that guaranteed viable curriculum for all. <coughs> and for context, I want people to understand why I asked 
This is Vazit. How long have you been teaching here? Uh, 22 years. 22 years. So he came out of college <coughs> having come through a system of I'm going to teach you a foreign language. And he's now transitioned into we're learning a foreign language that is going to be meaningful, mm -hmm. not just expo. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we, we started on this process about 10 years ago at the upper level, and we've just got it down to the lower levels now in the last three years, I'd say. Um, and so it's, it's a long process through all of that. And this work's been going on at the middle school for how long? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. and all, uh, <laughs> five, six years, maybe? It's, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Hard work. Can we hear from our students? Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, Thomas. Yeah, so, <laughs> in terms of the high school, it's really hard for me to really have any opinion of standards based on this one. I mean, I've only gotten a small sense of standards based. I touched on it a little bit of math. It's been brought up but not used in my Latin class. <laughs> but it's just a murky area for me. Uh, I remember in middle school it was a little bit different, but it's just uh, hard for me. And I think it's hard for a lot of uh, people in high school right now to really like, grasp what's going on. So uh, that's really what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's kind of similar. It's hard because my younger sister is almost 11 years younger than me, so I can not remember when I was her age. So I will say, though, um, I don't know if this is just our personalities. Maybe I'm a little bit more uptight than she is. Um, I just remember being furious whenever I would get, like, a 95 on something. and be like, why wasn't that 100? Like, I know I did all of that, right? And she seems to be a little bit more, oh, you know, I got a this on it, but I know that I can keep working and I'll get better at it, so it's okay. <coughs> and whereas I was like, I, my life is over, I'm, not, I'm never going to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> One of the things that we were bringing up is that before, we were averaging students learning. Well, in STEM, right? We're averaging students learning to get to that final grade. So if you came in not knowing, which we should accept that you come in not knowing, right? Um, but if you came in not knowing, and then you continue to grow over time, and by the end of the course, or by the end of the semester or marking period, you ended up knowing all that learning gets averaged and you'd end up somewhere in the middle. Where now, if you come in not knowing, we're not averaging your learning over time. As long as you're showing growth, that's the point of this shift, right? And so that's a big, that's a big difference. It's way more complicated to calculate and to how do, you, how do you determine the preponderance of evidence to know when students have learned. Um, but like, what, like Kelly Crosby said, it's about that feedback that we're giving students um, and that we're truly trying to develop this mindset of continual growth and learning. I think, I, think oh, I was just going to say, and an Thomas brings up an Im important point, because you're going to have different standards in every subject, including, for example, the Spanish standards that I have to hit are different than the Latin ones. So, um, you know, Thomas, you may not have known it, but do you do translations when you're doing Right, so th that's actually one of the standards. So you've actually, every time you've been doing a translation, your teacher may not have told you that, um, but that you're actually doing standards based there. That's interpretive communication. And so, and that Latin focuses more on that because it's not a spoken language. In Spanish, we have to focus a lot more on the interpersonal because it's a living language. So Spanish and French, we're going to do a lot more of those active kind of activities. We're not going to force you to do that in Latin, though. So, um, <laughs> so those standards are going to be different within a subject area. And so math is going to have different standards. Um, history is going to have different standards. So. Uh, it's, 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 and that's why sometimes different teachers will get uh, uh, upset with other teachers saying, what, what, is, what does proficiency based mean? Well, it can mean something different in different subjects, and that's why you have the different standards. So it's going to be, it, that's where a lot of the education comes in for teachers and students.
the complexity of this work really speaks to why we need um, time for all the professional learning to take place, mm -hmm. the time to align that curriculum in all the ways that Erica shared, and um, and why the graduation requirements that are that are part of what we're facing in the high school level are being phased in each year, so that some children will have that experience now or next year, and some will get it beyond that. Um, so I think kind of catching on, I don't remember who was talking about it, I'm sorry. Um, something that's kind of hard for the high schoolers right now is we are all so used to, especially I think like juniors and seniors, we are all so used to it being, you know, your end goal is, oh, I hope I get a really good grade on this thing. And I hope like the number on the top of this paper is really, really high because that means that I must know what's going on when the real end goal should be, oh, I know more about this topic now than I did a month ago. So I think for us, especially, <laughs> thank you, I think especially <laughs> um, kind of murmurings of concern and potentially panic that I've heard of the high schoolers, people are like, how is this gonna affect the AP classes? Like, oh, I have to get a really good grade on my AP exam, but the end goal is really, you know, you wanna make sure that you have more information on Know, this science than you did at the beginning of the year when you didn't know anything about it. So I think um, especially for some of the younger people that I've talked to in middle school and then like the freshmen at the high school are kind of thinking about that because they've seen their older siblings going through like, oh, well, I know that my older sister like got a 96 in her AP Calc class what does it mean if I get a three in mine? Like, what does that mean? Because that's kind of how our brains have been wired. Mm -hmm. So I think once students kind of realize that the end goal of this is more learning the information and making sure that you have a firm grasp of it, rather than making sure that you know how to memorize stuff well enough to get a good grade on your test, then I think that they're gonna <coughs> appreciate this system more and it'll probably make them appreciate their classes more because they'll actually be able to learn things instead of panicking on, oh, I have to get at least a 74 on this test to pass for the semester. So and, and that's why we're looking at it. Box. <laughs> that's why we're looking at this as a transition. So for example, we've been working um, on a new curriculum um, implementation at K-5 which um, built within the curriculum materials and the instructional methodology are the tenants to this, in which students know where they are, they know their goals in those pieces. And when we do our update on the, on the um, improvement plan, what we're seeing is we have to change our benchmark expectations for our students. Um, so where we might expect at the end of the year for some of our kindergartners to be at a certain reading level, um, by January on average all classes have met that halfway through the year under this system. So we're adjusting our benchmarks up because putting students in charge of their own learning is creating more rigorous learning as a result. <coughs> oh, go ahead, Jack. Because students are reaching goals in whatever level, three, four, will we still need mid-years? Will we still need tests because they've already shown their proficiency? Uh, that topic has come up in conversations among different groups. Actually, I was at a uh, meeting just on Wednesday with a group of teachers in and around that as we're trying to work through the system on how we're going to make certain decisions and the question came up and we had a robust mm -hmm. discussion around under this system, will there be a need for a mid-year exam? Will there still be that need or could that time be used for some other sort of activity. I, I also don't think that there's a problem with a midterm exam mm -hmm. in the sense that mm -hmm. it can be a another check-in point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to mean that if you have like this preponderance of evidence that this child has met the standard or even exceeded it and then they take this assessment, maybe maybe something's wrong with the assessment. Maybe the assessment shows that they're they're exactly where they've been growing to. Mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. We, we get to look at that as professionals and make decisions as a professional to say, I know what's going on with this kid. I mean, you're talking about a year's, a half a year's worth of information on one test. 
right? Mm. I, I think that we can all agree that that's a little challenging for anybody to go back that far. But it doesn't mean that it's worthless. It, it just means it's another point of information okay. to make a professional yeah. judgment. Um, can somebody expand on um, habits of work and learning, how that's going to be extracted from the grade? Before we do that, I can ask me. Yes, yeah. well, I was just going to respond to the word test. That's one pathway. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the mid-year or final opportunity could look a variety of different ways. It could be a showcase. It could be a portfolio. It could be some kind of presentation. It's not typically how we think of that sit-down paper pencil test. It's broadening those horizons. And on top of that, it could also be optional. That's another way that some schools handle it, is uh, if you've met the standards, you don't need to do the midterm because you've already met the standards. But if you haven't, maybe that's your multiple pathway. Maybe that's your additional <coughs> pathway. So there's lots of, lots of ways to look at it. And we would have to decide on a district how we'd want to do that. But that's another educational piece that we have to deliver to parents. Right. who are accustomed to the old ways, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we have to decide what, what we want to do first before we present anything there. Really where we're going is a more individualized, customized education plan for all students. So um, when we, as we talk about the habits of work and learning, and then I hope we'll next talk about the guiding principles, and then if David could talk a little bit too, what are some of the opportunities students are going to have in meeting graduation requirements? I think that would kind of be a nice sequence because we spent a lot of time talking about the content pieces, the academic pieces, but this is really about the whole child um, and what are all of the components that they need to be supportive and successful. So, um, does somebody want to speak about habits of work and learning first? Well, let me just start, but then I have some people <coughs> um, that are actually uh, using it in their classroom. So in the traditional way of um, grading kiddos, we would, goodness, we would grade homework. If a, kid, a student didn't pass homework in, it would be a zero, 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 zero. Um, then they may have received a 98 on the end of the unit test, but guess what? All of those zeros get averaged in, and the student might get a 75. Well, that doesn't tell us what the student really knows. So what was, what was going on with that student? Is it because they they knew the work and they didn't feel they had to do the homework, it's because they disorganized. What are the reasons for not doing homework? Habits of work pulls out those <coughs> behaviors and it's a whole separate grade and a whole separate way of looking at students and expectations. So the, the uh, academic score is just about what the student can do. Habits of work is what they can do, how they meet certain expectations, um, and again, let's talk to middle school students. And I do want Jake to talk about how he's using habits of work with his um, athletes. Yeah, want me to start with that? Sure. Yeah, so um, we use the habits of work and learning for eligibility uh, for middle school athletes. Um, so every two weeks we'll do an eligibility check. Um, they have to have at least a 70 or above in the four core classes at this point, classes that they have every day. So math, science, ELA, and social studies. Um, and if they have below a 70 in one of those classes, they get put on student athlete academic support. Um, so what it really starts with a conversation with me and the student. Uh, you know, we know they're struggling in a class, so now we kind of got to look at why they're struggling in that class. Um, so it's it's a simple rubric uh, where they have those all of that student's core teachers sign off each day. If they're uh, if they're responsible for that day in that class, so that so we're taking baby steps at it. So right now, that's just if they have all all of their work in. So responsible, they have all their work in. Uh, pure, uh, perseverance, did their effort meet the classroom standards for that day? And then respect did their behavior meet the classroom standards for that day. And if the teacher signs off on those, uh, then they can still participate that day. Um, so it's it's not a so. It's really, it's, it's kind of that continuous growth which falls right into, you know, the proficiency-based education in the classroom as well, so. And Jake, what, what have you told me about a student today? How yeah. does this affect their learning in the classroom? Yeah, a student went from failing, uh, having below a 70 in three classes, and then today when, we, when I met with the student, uh, he was passing all of them. So in middle school, it typically is one of those habits 
of work that's causing the struggling, you know, the struggling grades. So it's feedback to the student. Um, it's a chance to really get that improvement, you know, before we take you know, athletics away from the student. And this student that you know we have is athletics is pretty important to to them. Um, that's one of the only things that they have to look forward to after school. So. Um, when we say that habits of work is a separate grade, is it a separate grade in each class, or is it a separate grade as such? Like here's their grades and their four subject areas, and here's their habits of work grade, or is it alongside each other? Here's well, we're your working on okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if grade is even the right word. Right. It's more of but within all of this work, what we really want is the student to own the learning, right? And so where, how is the student monitoring and tracking their success? <coughs> and so um, we're still deciding, like, does that end up with a grade? Is it more about that self-reflection piece? Um, but we know the evidence is really clear that when students are in charge of their learning, when that self-assessment piece is the most, um, is the number one influence on, influencer on student achievement. So we're still trying to, like, balance kind of it seems like almost where another way where you could really tease out what's going on with the student if they yeah. have everything done every day in foreign languages but in social studies there's yeah. something bogging them down. Yeah. You know, right. they're having yeah. support yeah. Kind of very different from one class mm -hmm. to another. Mm -hmm. It's also a way to see, um, like let's say if we're, we're looking at engagement, and that's a kind of a common um, thing to look at in all of their classes. So you can see maybe they're engaged in three out of the four classes, so something's going on in that one particular class. How do we know that the homework, however, is necessary and or worthwhile? Great question. That's a very good question. We're having that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. in that school. Sometimes, yeah. you know, you know I, can, I can recall. <laughs> <laughs> Much of what I had for homework seemed to be busy work. I mean, a hundred addition problems, you know, when I was in second or third grade or whatever the heck it was. It just seemed like busy work. So the clarity that comes from having done that alignment work of standards, learning goals, and learning targets, and laying out your curriculum in a way that um, helps students to move through that learning helps the teacher to know um, if there's a need, for instance, for additional practice. And if that, so that's one way to use homework, right, as additional practice in your math example. So if, if I have students who are in the learning and they don't have that learning content that they need, then they need more practice with it. Or I may want to do some of those interactive activities with students as they come into my classroom. And so the homework may be on more of a flipped classroom model where they do, they watch a video or they do some reading before they come into classroom so we can then move into that. But because I have those standards learning goals and learning targets, I as a teacher am much, much clearer about how I'm going to help my students move through that to get to those learning goals and learning targets and where they are in the process, throughout the process. And as students learn and are, know those that content and what's expected of them. Um, the teacher also has a better, an opportunity to describe the purpose of the homework. So some homework may be because a child needs practice. Some homework may be because the teacher wants some, the students to think about a particular topic before coming to class. Mm -hmm. So there are multiple purposes for homework, but by having the content or the skill or the knowledge clearly articulated and that learning plan in place allows the teacher to better describe what's the purpose of doing this homework. It really is about learning, not just about busy work. How can we in an educational system in the town of Scarborough ascertain that the teacher's goals and the parental goals for their child and the student's goals are on the same path? That would be guiding principles. That's Mm -hmm. That would be where we were, are going with our guiding principles. Yeah. So good in our before we talk about that, I would just connect back to the habits of work in learning. And what we're trying to do is is really help students understand that that knowledge isn't fixed. That you can truly learn anything when you put forth 
the, the appropriate effort to do so. And so um, our job is to make sure that students understand the impact that effort has on learning, um, but then also that when, when the efforts put forth in learning still isn't occurring, if there's some other specific need or um, some additional support or maybe some accommodations or modifi modifications need to be made, that we then can, we can isolate those things out in a more efficient way for our students. So it really is about changing their mindset, um, which means that we have to change our mindset to, to not say things like, you know, I'm not a math person or I'm not, a, I'm not an ELA person. You can be all of those things with the right effort. And so we gotta, ha sometimes we have to, sorry, sometimes watch our, our words and the way that we express areas that we're really strong in and areas that we need to continue to grow in um, so that we can help our students shift that mindset too. But what if the student doesn't want to shift that? I have a problem <laughs> as an educator. And I was an educator for a long time. But I have a problem uh, with our society today. And we're, part, we're all part of it. But I see parents who want their children to do this. I see a school district who have expectations and set the goals for the students that may or may not be in concert with the parents. And I see the students who say, I don't want to go to college. And here we sit bragging, and I do it too, that 90 some percent of our children who graduate from Scarborough High School go on to a college. And why do they do that? Because there's an expectation in the community and in the family and the school district that they do that, even though it may not be their goal. And I want, we say we're trying to educate our children for society. But have we truly listened to what their goals may be? I don't know, and I don't have an answer, but I think we need to listen to students more than we have in the past. It, it seems to me like this dovetails, this new way of looking at learning dovetails really well into that because this is a much more active and authentic way to learn, and it would prepare a student whether they're going into secondary education or whether they're going into the workforce because in the workforce your boss isn't going to say well you got a 70 today they're going to expect you to know where your weaknesses are and where you need to improve and to take some initiatives and to improve them um, and this is very similar actually to um, I went to Bennington College where you make your own plan and you <laughs> and you do your independent studies and you you write your plan you have to get it approved by the powers that be and um, and you go off on your own educational journey and so it, this applies to everybody who wants to be a, from somebody who wants to be a plumber to somebody who goes to Bennington hippie to be you know school <laughs> and <laughs> write their plan so um, I think that it's such a nice way to shift um, the focus and that would apply to what kids want to do as well as our goals. One of the pieces around the guiding principles we've been talking about the content areas quite a bit we also um, <coughs> not only are required by law, but it makes sense for us um, to focus on the guiding principles because those are the lifelong skills. And we're not looking at the guiding principles as another set of standards and learning goals. We're looking at the guiding principles as students putting forth evidence that they are growing in becoming a clear and effective communicator, a self-directed lifelong <coughs> learner. The students, it'll be the body of evidence that a student put forward to demonstrate that they have grown in this area. Now we're required to um, decide whether or not a student is proficient. And in our discussions with our, um, in, within our work group, proficient really needs to look like whether or not a child has the ability to identify their strengths, identify the areas they need to work on here, develop an action plan, develop a plan for improvement for themselves in moving forward. <coughs> so it is that lifelong skill of being a continuous learner, being an independent learner, knowing when to ask help, knowing what your goals are as a person, being able to communicate those goals and have conversations so that you can continue that process after you leave the halls of Scarborough High School. 
So the guiding principles is really the area in which we hope to tie that all together for students. And that might be a nice segue to talk about some of the things that the high school is thinking about in terms of their um, graduation requirements or experiences because it's not going to be all just about gathering credits. It's really about this process. And we're building this process not just at the high school but at K2, at 3-5, at 6-8, and 9-12 because that ability to know what you do well, know what you need to work on, set a goal, work on that, make that improvement, and continue on is really a lifelong girl goal and we want students practicing that at the appropriate developmental level all the way up through and then really students are walking out the door with their own transition plan is really the ultimate goal. So as part of that conversation though it would be great if we could tie in so 9-12 obviously is the culmination and that's where the diploma is going to come. If we can also tie in how um, students that access education differently require some supports, how special ed ties in. I think that is like point that is somewhat confusing for some parents um, and they may have some questions about how kids can show their proficient in their own way as they're, as they're getting involved. So what do you want to start with, the graduation requirements or the answer to the question about students showing proficiency? Well maybe me. I'll jump in quickly and say that is a critical question that we're trying to sort out and I think most everybody in the state is trying to sort that out. Um, so I feel very passionately about all means all and earning a diploma. All students have goals. All students are making progress. All students are continually learning. Uh, the DOE has given us guidance um, that proficient means proficient. And we don't agree with that. We're trying to sort that out. Um, I don't know where it will end up. Uh, they don't allow a differentiated diploma right now. Uh, it's insulting to think of an attendance certificate or something like that. Uh, how we look at rubrics is a level two, maybe something we can look at versus a level three. These are all the questions we're trying to sort out. It's challenging. Thank you. You know, our, our work with our graduation requirements has really been, um, you know, over the past few years, there's been a lot of really great and creative ideas. And Scarborough High School has wanted to change or evolve our graduation requirements. And, it's, and we've been waiting for the perfect opportunity to do that. So with the proficiency-based diploma laws, our new graduation requirements that we'll be bringing to the board uh, for review. Really, it, it captures um, the proficiency-based diploma requirements that you've all heard outlined for you tonight. That's all contained within our new uh, diploma requirements. But really, we're looking at the whole child. So, you know, a really quick rundown would be um, we will identify the courses where students can demonstrate proficiency in the standards in specific content areas. So we'll start with math, English language arts, uh, science and technology and social studies for next year. And then as has been mentioned, each year after that, students can choose a content area where they want to be able to have that content area be the content area that they have to show proficiency in. So what does that mean for us next year? The, the four that I mentioned have to be prepared for freshmen to be able to start showing proficiency in those content areas. The other content areas have to finish their work with that so that the following year, you never know which student what students are going to choose for a content area. So the entire school has to be prepared for that following year. Uh, the law also says that while students are in high school, they have to have an educational experience in math, uh, science, and English language arts. Right now, we're looking at whether we're going to make that a requirement for math, ELA, social studies, and science, or as opposed to those three. What does an educational experience mean? They would go through those recommended courses enabling them to show proficiency in the standards, but then there would be experiences that they could draw upon that would count as a mathematics experience. It could be uh, a vocational school. It could be an internship. It could be, there, there are so many different educational experiences that they could draw upon. That provides flexibility for students to meet that graduation requirement, but more importantly, it starts to have us do what we want <coughs> them to do, which is broaden their opportunities to get involved in learning and not just be 
taking a course at our high school, which is an option, but getting involved in some of those things I just described. So our graduation requirements would tie to those four requirements, and then we're going to still have students that are going to be required um, to show proficiency in physical education and health. Um, we're not having world language be a graduation requirement for next year, but we're working very hard at looking at what the world language requirements would be if it did become a graduation requirement. So that's potentially going to be for the following year, class of 2022. Um, what I think is one of the most exciting things, and Julie and I have had countless conversations about this aspect of it, is I, I think a lot of us has all, have always felt like we need to be providing students with some opportunities to have them grow academically and personally. So a component that we're going to add is called a personal learning experience where over the four years or however many years it takes students to complete high school, they're going to be engaged in personal learning experiences like um, internships and service learning projects and um, taking courses at a college, but also they're going to be engaged in personal wellness experiences. We've had students that have been involved in taking uh, figure skating or, or Boy Scouts or things that are learning experiences that they can choose to be their own personal learning experience that will fulfill the requirement of participating in something like this each year they're in high school. And the cool part about it is, is that we would have them continue the great work they've been doing with capturing in a digital portfolio their experiences. We would create, and we're in the process of uh, Jen Adams, our tech integrated coach, creating this right now, is creating perhaps a website where they can digitally capture all of these learning experiences. And at the end of their senior year, they would be able to provide a senior exhibition where they capture that learning, that growth, those experiences that are tied to what they've done each of those years. That senior exhibition can also be tied to what Monique was referring to for the guiding principles. Evidence of how they've grown as a clear and effective learner. So we think this is a more realistic approach to capturing that particular graduation requirement. And you all know that at the end of uh, the senior year, we struggled with finding what in the minds of some seniors is really meaningful experiences to finish out. A lot of them, right Lizzie, like March, April on, they're ready. So, so now they get a chance to reflect and look back at that digital portfolio on their learning and their experiences over four years and they can capture in their own way an exhibition. And it would be a panel that would be consisting of staff that have already been decided, but we would allow the students to choose others that they'd like to be on the panel. It could be teachers from Wentworth or a parent or somebody who's helped them along with the journey. So that senior exhibition and that personal learning experience is an added component that we're really excited about. And uh, to dovetail off, we have got school and business partnership where there are members of this community that are dying to get involved with Scarborough Public Schools and support learning. And we're going to use some of those resources to capture these personal learning experiences. So it's really perfect timing. You know, this new diploma is just in a small part tied to the proficiency-based law requirements. The big picture is we're, we're putting together what I think Scarborough Public Schools feels is a set of graduation requirements that captures what we're hoping the experience will be for our students K-12. And if I could just add to what Dave is talking about, this work is so unbelievably exciting and it really, it's not driven by the requirements of the law, it's driven by our vision of what we think um, the most authentic educational experience can be for our students and so I will feel like we have we're there when our students don't sit in a class and ever ask why am I here or why am I learning this and so we want to make sure that everything they're doing they can see the connectedness and they also have pathways that they can see clear paths to so we're also working on developing some career academies we're hoping to launch our first career academy in 1819 um, that will allow students to explore different careers, but then as they select a pathway, like say an IT, like an information technology pathway, that um, gives them opportunities to, to gain knowledge that's going to lead to career options, um, life options, or college options, so that it's not just about you know, getting everyone ready for college, but getting them ready for life. 
and that they can graduate from high school earning college credits if that's what they choose, if that's the pathway they choose, having technical experiences if that's the pathway that they choose, um, having um, accreditation in certain areas if that's the pathway that they choose. Um, and it's really it's completely different than the experience that any of us have had in a high school or that our high school students are currently having. Um, and it, it is really, really exciting. And the only way that we will do this well is with those community business partners. Um, so that's become a very important priority for us as we're starting to really reinvent what high school can mean, not just what high school can mean, but what school can mean, because we, we're already exploring some of this at the middle school and um, in the lower grades as well. Tom? Tom, um, yeah, I was just wondering about setting career academies and the relationship that would have with possibly vocational education, because I, I would see that the two would be intimate, intimately connected in many ways because vocational you know, learning, I think, is focused very much on you know, career pathways and having those two <coughs> That's interesting you should bring that up. You'd think that you and I had planned this coming in. So uh, I was just in a meeting, uh, for those of you who have heard, uh, the Bridge Year program. There were 22 schools in the state of Maine. Most of them are in the uh, central Maine area. And I was meeting with a couple of building principals and Westbrook Regional Vocational Center. And what they are offering to us is, um, and we don't know if we have the time to do that for next year. It might have to be something for the following year. But basically what would happen would be we would have four teachers, math, science, ELA, and social studies that would be willing to teach a college course for juniors and seniors. And so we would want up to 20 students, and it's not necessarily students who are already enrolled in vocational programs. It's those students um, that the connection between school and career would be really important for them to explore. They get uh, college credit for these classes at $40 a credit over two years and they have to also be enrolled in a vocational, one of the programs at Westbrook Regional Vocational Center. Uh, the only cost to them is for the credits. Uh, the vocational center takes care of all the equipment, supplies, and textbooks. Um, you could successfully start college if you go with your freshman year taken care of at the tune of about $1,200. Am I math correct? And more importantly, what Thomas just mentioned would be that opportunity to take a college level class and then also see the connection to career with the vocational program. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really exciting. Um, I haven't had a chance to share that with you yet. I've just shared it with, with Julie, but um, that's something that will be another possible avenue for students to go and get some of those learning experiences outside of Scarborough High School's walls. And so this goes back to the multiple pathways, right? So there still will be the CTE program as it currently is. Right. And students will still have access to it in the way they currently do. There will be these career academies within the high school that students will have access to. Um, and then there will be this kind of hybrid of both where they're getting some of these, um, earning some of these college credits, still engage with the CTE and, you know, in the traditional kind of <coughs> setting. I imagine that as this works, Evolves, and as we gain more clarity, there will become more and more pathways for students. Um, but it goes back to what I was saying earlier about that customizable, personalized, individualized education plan for each student. And it has the flexibility for the school to determine what those college courses are that those four teachers are teaching. So if in our junior year, in order to satisfy various graduation requirements, we want them to be teaching a U.S. history course, for instance, well, we have, they will go and find for us the college that will allow us to teach that college course. And all the law allows for those college courses to meet the graduation requirements for a standards-based diploma. So they've done all that legwork for us. Um, and I think one of the things I would add is sometimes when folks hear about this, they worry that it means that kids have to decide what they want to be when they grow up, when they're freshmen or when they're sophomores. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the intent behind it. The, the idea is that students actually have opportunities to fail forward, to test things out, to explore things um, before it gets them in a lot of debt or their parents mm -hmm. <laughs> at the college level. Um, but again, that it's, it's it's still meeting the standards, but in a really authentic way. So getting back to that, you know, never wondering why I'm doing this and really seeing the reality behind the work that they're putting in. So I think 
first of all, I'm super jealous that all of this is going to be happening once I'm done. It sounds really great, but it's fine. Um, so I think it's really interesting, Mr. Peach, because you'd think that we had planned this because we've been having this conversation at my house right now about um, plans after high school. So, so I think that also something that I've been talking to other seniors and juniors about is that a lot of people don't really know that they have options other than mm -hmm. as soon as I graduate, I'm going to go to college for four more years and then either try to get a job or go back to school for however many more years and just keep going and going and going. Or I don't want to go do four years right off the bat, so I might as well just try to get a job as soon as I get out of high school. So I think that this, especially with having the option of taking like a handful of higher level courses, like you said, Mr. Murder, about um, before it forty billion dollars per class <laughs> or something like that. Um, so yeah, like that. Um, it kind of gives students the opportunity to test it out because um, I think that's something that at least a lot of people I know have struggled with is, you know, you can be enrolled in five AP classes and, you know, they're all like pushing you towards, oh, I'm going to take all these science classes because I think I want to go into med school, but then you get there and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this at all and now I have no clue what I want to do because I didn't really like test the waters and have that chance to experiment other things. Um, so I think that's really great. And then also, this is kind of off the bat, but I just have a question. Um, I am wondering how the guiding principles and kind of this whole idea of proficiency in <coughs> education, how is that going to affect students who have IEPs? Because I know I have family members and friends who have IEPs and have special accommodations for, you know, they have anxiety and other things like that. So I'm wondering, are the proficiency level description is going to change for them? Is it going to be like different proficiencies made for every student? How is that going to, or is it going to be lumped that if you have this kind of IEP, you're going to be in this proficiency group? So I'm just kind of curious as to how that's going to work. No, no, it's, it's a great. Do you, oh, do you want me to take that one? Well, I'll respond and then you can. Okay, jump in. sounds good. Um, I, I got a little passionate about answering. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is Murphy's question before. We're not really sure. Yeah. Um, we're trying to sort that out. Uh, we're not in agreement with what the state is saying right now. Really, the state is saying level three <coughs> proficiency means level three graduation requirements in all those areas. That's what it means for everybody. Um, certainly, depending on the degree of disability. Some students with accommodations access these level three, level four proficiency levels. For those that um, are more significantly disabled, uh, we are still passionate about their growing and learning every day. And they have goals, and they can set targets, and they can monitor their growth. So how, how can we speak to that uh, in what I feel is an equal manner? their rate of growth and learning is just <coughs> as valid as anyone else's. Uh, so we're trying to sort that out. And, um, we're committed to finding a way that every student gets a diploma. Uh, I think the state, uh, the DOE, the Department of Education, and all the, all the towns are in a conflict mm -hmm. over that right now. There is one um, town that has set a school board policy that does allow an IEP uh, to amend the proficiency level with a written, ongoing, assessed agreement between student, family, and school. Um, that hasn't been tested yet. So we're, we're all waiting to see really what will we be allowed to do. But um, I think people are very passionate that everyone should be able to have the opportunity to get into diploma and all the other rich uh, requirements that we're putting in at Scarborough. And, and part of Lizzie's comment about um, 
the internship that I mentioned before, we're looking at having an internship coordinator who is going to be working with school and business partnerships for those job shopping experiences and apprenticeships and uh, have it tied directly to a curriculum. Those experiences that, that students now have the flexibility to take, or if it's rigid, hopefully will provide students with the opportunity to see some of these things before they graduate from high school and start making a determination in their mind, you know, I thought I wanted, I shouldn't say this, but every business leader I've ever talked to uses this example so I do that. I thought I wanted to be an accountant. So I went and I did an internship with an accountant and afterwards I realized I, I don't want to be an accountant for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what the profession is. So unless they've had some of those experiences and had an opportunity, it's hard for students to make informed decisions like you're talking about. That's why these graduation requirements talk about an educational experience in these different areas. Math, they can they have a, a wealth of resources to choose from for an educational experience that will not only be a great learning experience for them in that area, but can guide them on some of their future choices. And I can't count the number of students who have said to me, I would have loved to have taken a vocational class, but I didn't have room on my schedule. And I was told I had to take these classes to get into a good college. And so we're trying with our new graduation requirements to have the flexibility to meet those, those needs that they haven't had the chance to do in the past. And to reshape people's opinions about vocational mm -hmm. technical education, because I think mm -hmm. there's this um, unfortunate myth that exists out there that if you're taking career technical education courses, you're not on a, ca a college pathway. That's absolutely incorrect and inaccurate. Um, it's, it's a different way to learn and a different setting with materials and resources that we can't necessarily provide in the, in the traditional high school. Um, and so that's also part of our work is to really change the narrative around what career, career vocational technical education is and can be and can mean in terms of creating opportunities for students. Did you want to add something? No, that's fine. I see another question. Oh, I was just going to kind of to add on to that. Um, I think something else that's really great about <coughs> the overall theme of um, allowing students to kind of test things that are different to them is I think it'll be easier for students if they have, you know, if they grow to learn that maybe this is a path that they're wanting to take that I'm thinking it'll probably be easier for them to change that because I know I have friends who because um, halfway through the year they realize you know, I'm really struggling with this, and it really doesn't make sense for me to keep doing it. It's something that I'm either not passionate about, or it's just, it's not working for me, um, and have tried to get it changed, and either weren't able to because of scheduling, or because of that, or, you know, well, if you wanted to not take that class, you know, the only reason, way you'd be able to replace it is by taking a class at USM or NCC because it's a higher level class. But, you know, highly involved student you can't really make time an hour and a half, two or three times a week to go take a class somewhere else. So I'm thinking, correct me if I'm wrong, but this manner of conducting business will probably make it easier for students to kind of edit <coughs> what they need so that they'll get the most out of what they think. So I think Good. I think what this whole system of learning creates is flexible learning. Kids who are not afraid to take challenges, that are in charge of their pathways and their education, and they know what is expected of them, and they know that there are other ways that they can meet the expectations, and if they're not particularly <coughs> fantastic writers, but they're great presenters, they can do a presentation, they can do a computer model instead of uh, Equations. I mean, I think there's a thousand different ways kids can show that they have learned it, and I think it's amazing that they're going to have that opportunity. So kids don't get stuck, you know, maybe finishing law school and knowing at that point you don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it saves you a lot of time and money if you are as flexible and you're thinking in advance of that that you can stop if it's not where you want to be headed and you can take a new path. So I think we, we're just... It's an incredible opportunity for the district, and I, you know, it was the impetus was state law, which is for better or worse what we have. But the way we are going to express that and deal with it, I think, is 
going to be um, a huge asset to the community and to the learners that we're sending out. <coughs> so. so just one point of clarification, the state law does give us some due dates and deadlines that are um, creating a new sense of urgency. Uh, for, for me, I'll speak for myself, but this work has been going on in Scarborough. I mean, you heard Eric talk about 10 years, you heard Barb talk about doing this work at the middle school for five, six, seven, eight years. Um, and, you know, so I, I know that the due dates and the deadlines, I think, are almost helpful at this point because we could spend a lot of time trying to get it right. And said we're trying to get it started and giving ourselves permission to really rebrand failure as a first attempt in learning um, and looking at it as a positive, not only for ourselves as the adult learners in Scarborough, but for our students um, and letting them, it's better to take a risk um, and to try than to not try at all and never know. So um, it's a really exciting time. It's, it's intense. <laughs> It's busy. We're working really, really hard, um, and it's a lot to balance all at once, but we're being super thoughtful about the work that we're doing, um, and we're really trying to, um, to map out the next step, because we know our next step is really to engage the students more in the conversation, and we really look at our students as being the best teachers of this work that if they understand the work that's happening and the shifts that are occurring, um, that they'll be able to educate their parents um, in a way that some of the parents sitting at this on the school board have already experienced with their own students. Anybody else have any questions or comments? I just wanted to suggest to the parents who are, are listening to us that you ask questions of your student and of the teachers and administrators who are delivering the education. I think we all need to listen better to the students themselves and actually listen to what they have to say about what they would like to do and what their goals are. That's very difficult to do sometimes because parents and teachers have expectations. Uh, they want the best. We want the best for our students, but sometimes we lose the focus of what the students might want or need. Um, I also want to point out, because the cameras can't show up, but we had up to nine people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that was twice what I was expecting, so I sincerely appreciate everyone coming out and listening, because it is, like, obviously we're very excited and engaged in the conversation, but this meeting was a chance to really start sharing what's happening in our schools. Um, this, this is a big attendance for us, so thank you for coming. <laughs> um, and if you have questions, by all means, email us and we can get follow-ups for you. Um, but thank you. Go spread the word, and I hope people are watching at home, too, because it's, it's coming. It's, it's here, and this is changing our vocabulary and your kids. and. Um, I'm glad you went first because you put the positive spin on nine people, which was not going to be my spin. I wish <laughs> um, more people were here to, to know about this and to understand what's happening. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on that because I think you were nice to have a positive spin. But I did want to thank our staff that are here. I mean, it's, you know, 8.30 at night on a Thursday night. There are more fun things to do than be here at a school board meeting. So thank you for the job. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, but I do want to also remind everyone that the website, our website, our, our, all of our meetings are on the town website, and so you can access them there. And then we can also post on social media a link to this particular um, workshop so that folks can share. I know we plan on sharing it out with our whole staff so they can hear the message in the way it was shared with the community. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to promote is increased communication across the board. So um, this is one of our, our tools for doing that. That's great. So if there's nothing else, I think this is 8.0. Are there motions or adjournment? So moved. Second. All in favor? Six plus two. Thank you. Thank you.